and confess our sins unto God and our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me.
by your help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called, up, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. Now I am gathering a couple of sticks, that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You cannot serve God and money. 
Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God, God, light. 
greetings to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Around 900 years before the birth of Jesus, Elijah bursts onto the scene as the, that prophet par excellence, the prophet who comes with all the force and the impact of one sent by God himself, bearing the word of the Lord to God's people in a very straightforward and a fearless manner. Well, Elijah is God's answer to an evil king to King Ahab and Jezebel, to their attempt to make Baal the false god of Israel. Baal was one of the Canaanite gods. He was a storm god to whom sacrifices would be made so that he would provide good weather for the people. And now, Elijah calls on the god of Israel, the god who doesn't tolerate idolatry, to prove that Baal was helpless before him, that in fact, Baal doesn't actually exist. The Lord, then, speaking through his prophet, would withhold dew and rain for a period of time, and the whole land would go through a severe drought. Well, Ahab and Jezebel were filled with a murderous rage. So God directed Elijah to, to flee, to go into hiding, basically, to go from there and hide in this secluded place, and that God would provide for him in that time of need. And twice a day, God sent ravens to provide food for Elijah, bread and meat. And as God did that as well, Elijah was right next to this brook. And so he had water to drink as well. And so God sustained him for a period of time. And then the brook dried up. Now, as the brook dries up, Elijah probably was thinking, what should I do? And God then tells Elijah now to go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon which was in the Phoenician territory, and to dwell there. That probably wouldn't have made much sense, because where Elijah was hiding out, it would have been much easier just to go over to the Jordan River, which never dries up, and which has typically an abundance of, of food nearby. But Elijah listens to the Lord, and he obeys God, who has reasons for sending Elijah to Zarephath, to the home of a particular Phoenician widow. And that's where our Old Testament reading for today picks up. Elijah goes as he was commanded, and he meets the widow. And after asking for a drink of water, he calls out to her again, and he asks for food, for a little bit of bread to eat as well. And she balks at this request, not out of a lack of hospitality, but because she has no such bread to give. She has only enough for her last meal, for her and her son, and then seems like she's prepared to die. She backs up her point then as she speaks to Elijah in the strongest possible way. As the Lord your God lives. That's the strongest oath that an Israelite could ever make, is one in the name of God. But notice here that this woman says, your God. And implying that this Gentile, this Phoenician woman, did not yet claim the Lord as her God. And so Elijah responds by telling the widow, do not fear. Despite what the widow had said, he tells her to make some bread anyway. But notice what he says. He says this, first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Now Elijah knows that she has said that there's not enough flour and oil to do this. 
But he deals with her fear first by saying there's no reason for it. And second, then by indicating that a miracle was about to take place. That though she used what she believes to be the last of her ingredients, that the flour and the oil would be miraculously renewed. And it was. The jar of flour wasn't spent, and neither did the jug of oil become empty. And they ate for many days until the Lord sent rain again and ended the drought. Until the crops could once again start to grow, and the widow was able to buy and to receive adequate food. And this, according to the word of the Lord, that was spoken through his prophet Elijah, the word that the woman then heard, and she believed, and in her faith, and in the faith that Elijah exhibits throughout this whole ordeal, we are, rem we are reminded of this very simple fact and truth of our life. That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now during these years of Elijah and Elisha, more signs and wonders witness to the power of the true God than in any period since the Exodus. And in this miracle, the wonderful provision of food recalled God who sent manna to sustain Israel while the people were wandering through the wilderness during the Exodus. But even more, it foreshadowed the miracle of the greatest prophet, Jesus. This Jesus who by his own power and authority multiplied bread and fed thousands, not one time, but twice. And this Jesus, then, I think is a very interesting fact, whose only excursion outside of the borders of ancient Israel was to the region of Tyre and Sidon, where Jesus, as he goes there, meets a Phoenician woman who exhibits great faith in the midst of her daughter, who was plagued by a demon, and she begged Jesus for help. And while Jesus said, it's not good that we give, um, throw the bread out and waste the bread, she begs and says, yes, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs of their master's table. Because that would be enough. So this miracle that we hear about today, while it is a wondrous miracle in and of itself, the greater miracle that we hear of in our scripture readings is not just that God is the creator and therefore greater than the false gods that are made up in creation. It's that nothing and no one moves or breathes apart from this creator God. That the Lord who took upon our flesh and walked this earth has never been separate from the physical stuff of his creation, nor has he been ashamed of it. He does his creative work through and with and for his creation. The Lord works his miracle at Zarephath. But notice again, it's inside creation. Elijah, the widow, and her son, they eat of it. But it's always the Lord who is acting, the Lord who is doing, the Lord who is providing, whether it appears miraculous or even sometimes mundane and ordinary. And we're all paying attention today then. As we sang in the verses of the gradual right in between the Old Testament reading and the epistle. It struck me just this morning as we were saying this, how, how nicely these words fit up with these readings from Psalm 118. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. That ultimately our trust, our faith, 
is in God himself. Because by faith, by the trust in God's promises and his provincial care in Christ, we see the hand of God working throughout his creation and for the good of his people both in the realm of the gospel and through the church, but also in the world itself, through government, through food supply chains, through grocery stores, through farmers, through, through cooks and chefs and people who, who provide this food and this care for us. In the same way, through Elijah, the Lord miraculously provides food for this widow at Zarephath, and this account then illustrates God's never-ending goodness toward his creation, even when they don't deserve it. For the Lord makes the rain fall on the good and the evil alike, and he daily and he richly provides for all of our needs, blessing us far beyond what we deserve and what we ask. In a wicked, in a harsh, in a hostile world, God watches over those who are his, that no matter how much everything may seem to be against us, even when we're down to the very last handful in the crumbs, the Lord is with his people, a haven of everlasting love. And this faith in Christ, then this faith in Christ casts out the anxiety, the fear, and it leads to a dependency and a freedom in being a beloved child of God, that God cares for the birds and the flowers and all of his creation, but God has a closer relationship with you. That God did not become a flower of the field nor a bird of the air, but he became a man in order to save, to preserve, to care and provide for mankind for you. So Elijah's words to you are just as important as they were to the widow. Do not fear. You may have little, or you may have an abundance, and you may be going through a time of drought and despair, of worry and concern over your life or the life of your loved ones here in this fallen world, but God is still God, and Jesus is still risen from the dead. And he attends to the needs of your soul, he attends to the needs of your body in this sinful world. And the powers of hell then cannot touch you. For even in death, God will preserve your life. And that your last meal here on earth then will not be your last. For God has prepared an eternal banquet for those who belong to him. For those who have God as their care will have no other here in time or there in eternity. So may that peace of God that passes all understanding, that chases away our fears, our anxieties, and worries, may that peace of God guard and protect you in the true faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please rise.
Strengthen us in the faith and fill us with your spirit that we might trust in you for all things temporal and eternal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, show your abundant mercy to all those whom you have called to preach Christ and him crucified. According to your gracious will, grant faithful pastors to all congregations and restore the service those pastors restore to service those pastors without a congregation to serve. Provide for your people in need so that we may continue to live off of the very word of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant opportunities for honest and faithful labor to all, especially to the unemployed, and give us all contentment and joy as we carry out our daily tasks according to our God-given vocation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant wisdom to the President, Congress, and Supreme Court of the United States, to the leaders of our states and local governments, to the rulers of this world as well, that they would seek peace, promote life, and protect the weakest among us. Guard and protect those who serve in our armed forces and emergency services that, may, that they may serve with integrity and return home safely. Lord, in your mercy, and hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, give ear to our prayers for the sick, the suffering, the lonely, the shut in, the depressed, the dying, and all those who are mean. Especially for Jamari, recovering from surgery, Carolyn, recovering from stroke. Linda Statsville and family mourning the death of her nephew, Josh, those affected by the fires and the smoke. Be merciful and gracious to them and strengthen them in their trials. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, according to your will and in your time, you call your children to rest from their neighbors. Receive our thanks for those who have gone before us in the faith, and grant that we, who walk as yet by faith, may join them in their holiness until that day when you, rock, when you raise us incorruptible and immortal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh uh -huh.
Christ, who when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye to this is my body, which is given for you. This do in our universe. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Thanks.
depart in peace.
Thank you all for joining us here this morning for our service. Just a couple of uh, brief announcements. First, um, in our next service at 1030, David and Jeanette Wolf are going to be celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. I believe that's actually today. And so uh, we're going to be having um, um, a, little, um, a little blessing during the service there and then um, cake and goodies afterwards. So I know probably a lot of you can't or are not able to go home and come back, but if you are, I'm sure you would greatly appreciate that. If nothing else, continue to keep them in your prayers. Um, Another announcement, uh, briefly again, a reminder that our youth catechesis has begun again. Last week was the first week. Today is when we really get into it. And so um, this year is our catechism year. So we're going through all the different portions of the catechism. Um, currently we have five, um, but we are open to more as well. So if you know of anyone who is in the pages fifth grade and up, who would like to learn a little bit more about the Christian faith and its implication in, in our lives, please let me know, and you're welcome to join at any time. Now, um, are there any other announcements? All right. Have a blessed day in the morning.